In this video, we're going to be talking about the Caterpillar 3208 diesel engine. Hey guys, Josh with the Adept Ape channel here today, and in this video we're going to be discussing the Caterpillar 3208 engine. And before I get into the video, I wanted to say thank you to everyone that has donated on adeptape at yahoo.com on PayPal, because I have a studio upgrade, a uh, new backdrop, new backdrop stand, uh, new lighting, hopefully it'll make the video quality much higher, and just wanted to say thank you. Now let's get into the video. So why would I be making a video on an engine that Caterpillar has stopped producing over 20 years ago? Well, the reason is, is because they produced this engine for nearly 20 years, and there's still a surprisingly high number of these engines out there. They put them in trucks, RVs, forklifts, generators, equipment, earth moving, everything. Um, so you might still run into these sometimes, and maybe you're wondering a little bit about them, or you own them, or you've had to work on them. So we're going to get into some of the specifics of the engine and some of the problems with the engine. Okay, so stay tuned. So let's start with the basics on this engine. The 3208 is a diesel V8 arrangement that was designed in the mid to late 70s by Caterpillar, and it had a production run from the late 70s through all of the 80s and into the early 1990s, at which point since it was a mechanical only engine, it was getting phased out by the 3116, which was also a mechanical engine, but it's quickly turned into an electronic engine. Now I've only worked on the ones in generators and trucks, and if you have a truck one or an RV one, you're gonna have a serial number that is going to range from a 02Z, 32Y, 40S, or 51Z. Those will be your serial number arrangement numbers. And this was a 636 cubic inch engine, and it was a 10.4 liter. So what were the horsepower ranges on this? Well, they could get very low, up from about 200 horsepower up to about 435 horsepower. But the wide swing on horsepower was mostly because the 3208 came in three different arrangements over its production life. The 3208 could be had in a naturally aspirated, engine and those are the lower horsepower ones typically then there was a turbo version this was a single turbo that was on the back of the block and of course ran off the exhaust manifolds and then there was what they call an ATAC an air to air after cooler turbocharged version and those made the mo most horsepower and this engine uses two cast iron heads it's a push rod engine it which means the camshaft is in the block. It's also a flat tappet engine. After that, cats stopped using flat tappet. They went to a solid roller design and pretty much all of their engines after that point had a solid roller design, which obviously less friction, longer camshaft and lifter life, but the 3208 was a flat tappet. It uses a single intake, single exhaust valve. The compression ratios could vary from 15.5 to 1 up to 18.2 to 1 compression ratio. And that really varied on whether you had a turbocharged version or a naturally aspirated version. If you've ever worked on one of these too, you'll notice that it looks very similar. If you've ever been into the crankshaft and the valve train, it looks very similar to a gasoline V8 engine. Uh, there aren't the bolt-on style piston cooling jets that most modern diesels have. It has very small, in comparison, rod bearings and main bearings. I think I have a set of those around here somewhere. So Cat made a C10 and a C12 at one time as well, and that was also a 10 liter engine, a C10, and the 3208 was a 10 liter engine, although the C10 was a six cylinder engine. This is the rod bearing that was on a C10, and this was a 3208 rod bearing. So, much, much smaller for the 3208 compared to the later engine designs. Now I have a, I have a 3208 piston as well. Um, you could, they made them in, this is a two piston ring design. You have your oil control ring on the bottom and then your piston ring on top. But you could also get a three piston ring design, which would be two piston rings, and one oil control ring, depending on what version engine you had. Now, 
The 3208 had a couple downfalls to it as well in the design. One was that it was a parent bore engine, which meant it didn't have wet liners that you could remove in case of cylinder damage. It was, like I said, similar to an automotive block where the bores in the engine block were non-removable. So if you did damage a cylinder, you would have to machine out the damage and push in a new sleeve, or you'd have to get a new engine block. That's a problem. So what about the fuel system? Well, it used a standard old style high pressure pump with the fuel lines that run into a nozzle that was between each of the valves and then that would fire the cylinder. So it was a strictly mechanical engine. They never made an electronic version of this engine. So it being a mechanical engine, uh, there is some specialty tooling if you wanted to work on the pump. Uh, there's some special tooling to get the gear off of the pump if you wanted to advance or retard or set the timing for the pump to the engine. Other than that, it's a fairly easy engine to work on because it's strictly mechanical. You don't need any special electronic tooling. It is a heavy engine as well. I used to own a Ford F-250 from the 60s, and it had a 352 that I pulled out and then I put a 460 in. And everyone used to say, oh, the 460, it's so heavy, it's so heavy, because it's around 650 pounds, which for a gasoline engine is heavy. Well, compared to 3208, it's very lightweight because the 3208, the weights range from about 1,600 pounds on the naturally aspirated one. It could go up to almost 2,000 pounds. That small engine weighed almost 2,000 pounds because everything was cast iron. You're talking two cast iron heads, a turbocharger, cast iron block. Everything's gear driven. It's just a very heavy engine. So if you were thinking maybe swapping one of these into a piece of equipment you had out for, say, maybe you had a gas engine in it, I would be leery to do that, to just due to the weight by itself. So let's get into some of the service intervals on this engine, and then we'll talk about the downsides to it and the pluses of owning one, and that'll be the video. So the service intervals CAD has are a 250-hour oil change. Now, why hours, not miles? Well, hours are a better indicator than miles because if you idle a lot, you're not accumulating miles. So that's the service interval for oil changes. What about valve lash? Well, Cat recommended a 2,000 hour service on valve lash and your valve adjustment's gonna be 15 thousandths of an inch intake and 25 thousandths of an inch on the exhaust valves. And those are basically all your service intervals. Now let's get into the downsides of the engine. So I already discussed that it doesn't have liners. That's a major downside because obviously if the cylinder's damaged, you're looking at major block repair or a new engine block. Fairly expensive. One of the other things that's a real big problem on these is the coolant crossover tubes. So between the cylinder heads and the humongous front structure on this, there's a coolant passage that's external. And depending on which engine you have, you can have a steel or a plastic tube with two O-rings and that seals the coolant passage between the head and the front structure on either side. Well, what happens is those O-rings will fail or if you have the plastic version, that can crack. And that's a real bad problem if it cracks. Now, if just the O-rings leak and you have the steel one, you can slide the tube back, change the O-rings, and you'd be okay. But if you have the plastic one, you would have to remove either the front structure, which is not a small feat, or remove each cylinder head. Also, not a very easy thing to do. Uh, those are really two of the big downfalls on this engine. Now, what are some of the positives? Well, obviously, it's an older engine, so you can get them used new, not new, but remand. Uh, they're not incredibly expensive. The fuel pumps are fairly expensive, though. But compared to the later electronic engines, if you had, say, a nozzle failure, opposed to a later model with an injector, where you're talking maybe $600 for a new injector, the nozzles are fairly cheap. They're usually about 80 bucks each. So if you had one nozzle that goes out, you're not looking at several hundred dollars to fix it. Now, 
that's pretty much the gist of this engine. I try to touch on all the subjects there. Um, I hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching.